Yeah, ma'am. I think we are ready uh, to start with with the introduction and process. That is not there yet. I'm starting there. Yes. Yeah, ma'am. I think we're ready uh, to start with, with the introduction. And... Okay. A very good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for joining in on a Sunday evening on a platform which is here to educate all the optometrists and something new which we're going to learn in today. And today's session is very unique because it's going to be something very different for all of us, something which we may have known, but nothing much in detail. And this probably is going to be the uh, hope with the hopes that we are going to be in future talking about such things and we will see the new shift or transition into our practices through this method that we are bringing in today. And bringing forward this topic, of course, we have the favorite guest speaker who brings in new things. He's not a new name to all of us, Mr. Ajit Bhardwaj, who's a graduate of optometry from Ames, a postgraduate from Lotus College. He is a consultant and managing director. He runs his chains of optic optometry clinics. He's also been on the board of governors for World, of, World Council of Optometry and has represented the Asia Pacific uh, uh, Optometry Council. Now, talking about him a little more, the interesting thing is last few sessions, you have seen him bringing forward the telehealth, the concept, and he's already started practicing it. And his, uh, his optometry centers are actually seeing children and many patients through this telehealth method. He's also written a handbook recently on uh, the telehealth. He's been actively involved in many political uh, frameworks and has brought forward certain good initiatives for the profession. He's fought for the rights of all the optometrists. Besides that, he's a sportsman and he's represented India. And, at, and it's wonderful to see him fit and fine and hail bringing in the tennis uh, and optometry together. So it's amazing personality who's here with us and who brings forward the next topic because I'm not going to talk much about it. It's because something which even I'm going to understand and see how it is going to take the profession forward or what is going to come in from this, what he's going to talk, what can be uh, absorbed from it or what will be the future. It's all more to understand. Along with us is Oli. We all know him, Alulullah has been a person who's been actually uplifting the education as recently and he's cooperated with all of us to, he's been sitting across day and night bringing in this education besides his clinical practice that he has. He has many advanced skills and he's, he's developed new things, but more to introduce him today is his academy, which he is forming at the national level. So his initiatives are going further where he wants to bring in that uh, level of knowledge to every practitioner who's in the country, every student who's in the country and take it forward. So he is, I'm introducing him today as a, as a leader of the interim body of Indian Optometry Academy, which he is soon formulating so that uh, we can have education spread all across. So before I would have let Dr. Uh, Mr. Rajit Bhardwaj speak and take forward the session, we, I just now saw our favorite professor, Dr. S. Natarajan joining us. And I think the session would not begin unless I introduce him because he is the pillar and the strength for all of us. He's, he's really showing us, giving us the path to show that optometry and ophthalmology, how they can be together. Introduction to him is not new. Everybody knows him very well. We all, are, he's so dear to us, but yes, he has so many credits. In fact, I, when, when, he, when we go through sir's uh, credits, 
we realize that we may have had one award in our lifetime and two which we keep flaring up to read through all these sirs awards and achievements is something beyond the time control of this uh, session today the first is his padam shri award which is the highest civilian award and of course beyond padam shri award he is first a vitro retinal surgeon what surgery is done is one of the few names in the country after his guru dr badrinath who's brought in those numbers he has been representing the international council of ophthalmology as a board of trustee he's even got a seo excellence award from the sark academy he's been on the editorial of various forums of the world journals he has prestigious position in the society of trauma uh, ophthalmology society of trauma and all india ophthalmology society as a president he has been named the man of millennium award uh, which was an international award he has distinguished services award an icon six young achievers award and so many more to follow he is actually the founder of aditya jyoti foundation who's brought in sir not those achievements professionally that he has done his service to the society through this foundation where he is brought in diabetic retinopathy blindness and many more things and above all his research it's excellent to read his research papers which are such valued researches that he has brought in and published so we welcome you sir for thank being you. with us and helping our paths so thank you for being with thank us you. thank you yeah. And thank you thank you sorry for joining in late yeah i just said i think under the leadership of dr natarajan i would like you to begin forward your session thank you thank you it's always a privilege to have dr natarajan in our meetings and uh, you most welcome thank sir you. thank reason, you for having me there is a reason you, there is a bigger reason for you to be invited here which you may not know you know when i was going through the subject of artificial intelligence i realized that uh, many of the research in this field of artificial intelligence whether it was diabetic retinopathy whether it was uh, armd whether it was development of new applications in artificial intelligence many of them have done be by retina specialist so this was something new for me and i thought that you will be very interested to know what i mean i'm sure you must be knowing about this uh, more than me so i thought let me share my little bit of knowledge which i gather when i travel around it so happened that we had a tournament in shenzhen in november in 2019 and i happened to be there for a longer period of time because the tournament was lasting for another for 15 days so i spent almost 3 weeks there in shenzhen and then i realized the city of shenzhen is called uh, silicon valley of east and when i asked somebody why it is called silicon valley he said that this is the center of artificial intelligence this city is going to develop as one of the millennium city one of the city that will lead artificial intelligence not only in china but the rest of the world so that got me got me fascinated towards the subject and then i had an opportunity because i had a lot of time to visit certain hospitals in in guangzhou and in shenzhen and i had so many friends in optometry and my tennis fraternity so i visited so many hospitals so many schools and i like to share some of what exactly happened uh, and i'm sure that this is the first time optometrists are hearing the word of artificial intelligence and many of you may not know about what exactly it is so this is what my i'm not an expert you know i'm an optometrist i'm not an expert in neither artificial intelligence nor a computer nor a technologist this is just my information which i gather from my experience of traveling around traveling to hospitals then to different places and i thought that it would be a good platform to share with everyone so artificial intelligence and telehealth are the two new buzzword that we happen in this last 5 years telehealth precisely in last 5 months and telehealth in last 5 years tele uh, artificial intelligence in last 5 years so why it was happening and we realized that let's do some work and came to understand that there were few reasons behind it these were the two biggest interruptions two biggest change 
change which will come to optical, which will come to optometry, which will come to ophthalmology, which will come to healthcare in general in time to come. And why it is happening is the few reasons. Number one reason is our healthcare is in shambles. Num our population is rising. Our elderly population, we are the number two country in the world which have the maximum number of people at above 65 years of age at number two position after China. And what is happening is, just, as you know, as we age, there's more tendency to get age-related diseases. I don't need to name them. Diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration. And secondly, myopia, when you look at it, we have biggest population in China. We have biggest population in Asia, which is myopic. And this is going to be a cause that by 2050, every second person, today every third person is myopic, but by 2050, you will see that half of the world is myopic and half of the world is presbyopic. So the situations like this, whereby COVID situation, which has brought a lot of digital strain on everyone's eyes and uh, dry eyes, which is emerging so big in not only in India, but ever, everywhere in the world. So these are the factors which are contributing to maximum load on ophthalmology. You know, if you look at ophthalmology patients, they have been, you know, traditionally we had highest number of patients, even if I look at my school days in RP center, and I was just wondering when I was a student that why they need to create a separate center out of AIMS. And I was told that the ophthalmology has the maximum number of inflow of patients. And when I read more about it recently in, uh, in UK, in NHS, ophthalmology patients overshot all the other specialty and they had maximum number of patients in NHS. Every 10th patient who came was needing ophthalmology services. So ophthalmology services is going to be greater and greater demand. And as you know, in India, we have shortage of healthcare providers. There's hardly people who in our rural population, our 71% of the population which lives in rural area of India have hardly access to any optometry and ophthalmology. So what is happening in the healthcare is a challenge for our policymakers, is a challenge for our public, that healthcare economics, healthcare delivery revolves around three factors. Number first factor is the cost, accessibility, and quality. And what is happening is this, that whenever we try to bring the, any of those two or one factor, our challenge is this, that the cost and cost and qual cost should be low, quality should be high, and accessibility should be good. And that is very difficult. And these two interruptions, artificial intelligence and telehealth, are going to bring that disruptions, are going to change that equilibrium. Then we are going to break that triangle. And the cost, quality, and accessibility are the three factors behind the emergence of artificial intelligence in India and uh, throughout the world. All the countries, if you look at all the countries today for social development, for economical development, for technological development, for healthcare development, whichever area they are looking at, they are looking at the artificial intelligence as the topmost priority. In 2016, our, health, our AI spending was $39 billion, which rose to $73 billion in 2020. And it's going to be almost $100 billion by 2025. And the priority is this, that the countries like, in, obviously we know that the US is the top leader. They have the maximum number of, they have the heaviest investment. They have the maximum number of startups. And China is number two in artificial intelligence. And followed by, we have uh, Israel, which is very close to China. And then UK comes at number four. And if you look at the number of startups with startup in these countries in healthcare or total startups in artificial intelligence, US stands at 1,393 startups, while China has about 393 and uh, our India, we are at number 10th position. It's not bad, but if you look at the spending, if you look at the, our our healthcare spending, we spend only 2% of our, our GDP, less than 2% on healthcare. So our resources are never going to be enough 
So we need to make sure that we need to focus on these two area of artificial intelligence and healthcare. And uh, in time to come, what is happening is the, our focus, I was just reading what exactly is happening in India. And uh, I saw that Niti Aayog recently tied up with, with Google's and they formed four committees on artificial intelligence. One committee is for looking at your general central, uh, you know, citizens welfare or citizens, you can say that citizens strategic services. The other is on skilling and reskilling. Third is on data and R&D. And fourth is on social justice, your legal and regulatory bodies. There are four bodies they are going to form. And uh, if you look at in Bangalore has been our base for artificial intelligence, or you can say that our survival in the sense that our technology, Bangalore is called the Silicon Valley of India, not just because we have a maximum number of engineers, but we have maximum number of companies who, from technology, like if you look at all the technology company forces shifted from Pune to Bangalore. So Bangalore has become the hub for this. And Bangalore is having about 28% of our share in artificial intelligence startups. I was reading more about Bangalore city and the Bangalore city is uh, one that has about, uh, out of all the startups, most of the technologies, uh, engineers, our 23 IIT, and we have the largest, our advantage is that we have around 850,000 uh, workforce that enter into our engineering or workforce area. And that leads us to the way that we are even providing the human resource to almost all over the world. If you look at the Silicon Valley in US, most of the engineers migrate to US and uh, many of them, they work here in Bangalore. And uh, the reason is this, that the Bangalore has become an environment, but I don't see this happening in any other city of India. And that is something what uh, other state governments, other cities need to look at because Bangalore alone, it's not sufficient. The India is a huge country and uh, we need to see that artificial intelligence take out, takes up in other. And uh, when I read up some of the interesting applications of artificial intelligence, what Bangalore has developed, and it is not something related to us, but uh, one thing I want to tell you is just there's some interesting applications what they developed. And one of the application, most of Indians, they love music, they like to sing, and uh, they like to sing anywhere and they like to sing everywhere. So there's an app they developed called Riyaz, R-I-Y-A-Z. And this application, anybody from the right, from the very first day, he picks up his mobile phone, downloads his app and starts singing. And the app guides you, you know, which frequency you are off and which beat you are missing. And within a few days, it will tell you how to be a better singer and how to start singing. So one can just learn from this small, read another about this. So there's a company called in uh, Bangalore called RT Green which creates like a car, which your existing cars, it converts your normal car to a hybrid car within just a cost of $1,000. While in US, Teslas and other cars are being sold for $1,000, $100,000. So that is the kind of economy of scale India needs, whereby the costs are low. And that is where even if you look at the eye care, optimally fits in because you have to make sure that the cost for your services, cost for your products, cost of the devices, what you use, and your interventions should be such, such standard that the cost has to be low because you are the one who has to take care of the primary eye care profession. So not talking about much uh, on this, I would uh, like to tell you that uh, how, what all is happening in artificial intelligence. See first development that happened in artificial intelligence that was in facial recognition and facial recognition of faces, of object. And that's, if you look at countries like China, they don't have any system that nobody has cash there. Everybody uses the, just the face to pay. Any store you go, you have a QR code, you just take out your QR code and pay. Your, there is no credit card system, just your facial recognition leads you everywhere. Whether it is a metro, whether it is a purchase of even a small vegetable to a purchase of a, the purchasing a food in the restaurants, to anywhere you go, you will find that your facial recognition is your key. 
Second is this, that the way their surveillance of systems is used to enforce facial intelligence, you'll be surprised that they monitor people on the street. They monitor people. In India, we have the credit scores. Most of the companies, even most of the individuals, when we apply, the banks check your credit scores. They have a score called social scores, social credit scores. What does that mean? This that number of times you do a small offense like cutting a red light or overcrossing the or whatever could be the city norms, that leads you to deduct your score. And once your score goes above a certain limit, you're not allowed to travel in a taxi, you're not allowed to travel in a, in a metro, you're not allowed to travel in a train, you're not allowed to travel in a place. So that is how there was, this, there was a music concert and they applied this facial recognitions of this. They said, okay, let's, I mean, they were looking for criminals who were not caught and they found that they arrested 3000 criminals just one day, just using their facial intelligence. Facial intelligence they are using for recognizing elderly population. You know, when we are old, because of your Alzheimer's, people just look, uh, come out of the house, they go somewhere and they forget where they belong to. And people are lost. Sometimes even the, in, India, in India it happens that children are lost at a very young age. And when they are found after 10 years, 15 years, it's even the parents can't recognize. So artificial intelligence or facial recognition is helping people to recognize faces, to recognize, match those people, send those elderly back home, recognize those children who are lost. And then came the object detection, object recognitions. See, recognizing of object, like recognizing it of computer, the computer recognizes a cat, a dog, a human, a person, and that is how they recognize you in a diabetic retinopathy. For computer, object is the same. Whether you teach the computer how to recognize a person, or whether you teach a person how to recognize a OCT, or whether you teach a person how to recognize a refractive error, for computer, the technology is same. So we need to understand that these are the technologies like facial recognition, object recognition, speech recognition. Speech recognition is something that when we talk to computer, computer understand what our command is, that is called speech recognition. What is happening in speech recognition today is today, I can clone my voice to a computer. I can speak to a computer and within 10 minutes, computer will speak exactly like my voice. I can give it a text and the text will be read in my speech, in my tone, in my frequency, in my beat. So this is called cloning of speech. Then you saw, I saw the latest development, not the latest uh, for, from our point of view, but Google Translate. For China, you know that when you go, you can't speak, you don't speak English, everything in Chinese. And Google Translate is something that you take your mobile anywhere, you point your telephone to the whatever you want to read, and it turns into English. Similarly, whatever you speak, it turns into English. So Google Translate is not just in one language, but in all other countries you go, you can use your Google Translate to turn. So this is what speech, your speech recognition it talks about. Then you can see that in transportations, I was in Shenzhen and I realized that every bus they had was electric. Every car they used was electric. Every parking, whenever you go in a taxi, the taxi driver has to tell, ask the computer GPS, show me a parking space and he'll be guided to a parking space. That's how the technology works. And even in COVID-19, I just saw, saw how they were detecting COVID. You know, the police, they used their thermometers in the helmet. And when they talk to somebody from a distance, they knew exactly what the temperature of the person was. And the temperature thermometers were used for measuring the, the crowd of people by drones, by different devices. And uh, even for COVID-19, when I read more about it, that they were, we were testing so many different tests, but what they realized is they came out with some algorithm and artificial intelligence and they started doing the only the chest OCT, chest, sorry, not OCT, but chest uh, MRI. And within the few seconds, within 15 seconds, they were able to detect whether the patient has to be quarantined or whether the patient has to be, you know, is, is not having any COVID. And this technology helped them to identify cases within the shortest possible of time. So technology is taking us not beyond what we have thought. If you look at even the application in farming, 
even in india we have 640000 villages artificial intelligence has been already been applied in those villages to check the soil density to see what crop can be productive to check weather conditions what weather will be conducive how what crop will be beneficial for this particular village in this particular district and that is where the artificial intelligence is heading us if you look at even our our uh, application in our judiciary application in our laws i was reading that there are 33 million cases pending in our courts and that is because of the same that the artificial intelligence needs to be applied artificial intelligence in other countries the judges now use to to judge when whether to give a bail to this criminal or not when this criminal will do the next offense so this is the level of artificial intelligence in general what is happening all over the world but when we look at how what when a country like in india all these things to us also to you also it may be looking like you know i'm talking something about some fictions but that's not fiction this is the reality but whenever in any country the wave of artificial intelligence come which are the four waves which uh, i would like to discuss the first wave that comes is called internet aid internet it which you me everyone is using today maybe we don't know but internet it is nothing but our use of uh, google that's internet your facebook recommendation of friends is internet it all these applications first comes in the in, because they have the google amazon microsoft they have the largest internet companies they have the largest data and today any company or any hospital or and any individual who have the larger data is the one he is the target or he is the one who has the capacity to build artificial intelligence around it and if you look the second application comes in business which is called business artificial intelligence and that is what we use in optical in our retails to sell to recognize our customers you know bank you know insurance companies it be our loan uh, departments our uh, all this business area is the number two, number 2 that's the second wave of artificial intelligence and third wave of artificial intelligence comes when which is called perception ai and perception ai what i talked about is the object recognition voice recognition speech recognitions this is the perception ai that's the third stage of ai and the fourth is autonomous ai and autonomous ai is all about autonomous cars autonomous robots autonomous or all, all these drones what we talk about so this is the four level of artificial intelligence what uh, we go through in any country and uh, this is what we will going to experience in india too but if you may wonder that why now why what was happening in what is what is happening in for last so many years that artificial intelligence is being discussed now the reason has been that our computers were very slow we had first to first four generation of our computers did not know how to store they could only act they were only primarily used for computing they were used for mathematical calculations they couldn't think they couldn't diagnose they couldn't detect and that that was the reason our computers were very expensive and uh, if you look at in earlier stages when you when uh, people had computers it was only in teaching education in universities and big hospitals and the costs were more than 2 lakhs 3 lakhs rupees and they were huge so that took a long time for it to come down and by it took them say by 70s 80s they started to become bit accessible bit affordable and people could afford them in their houses so by 1982 japan was the country which launched the fifth generation of computer and fifth generation of computer they were intelligent they could store they could predict they could think they could analyze they could be programmed and that is where the artificial intelligence took so long and after 82 they start there lot of uh, research started going into this and then by 2000 most of the developed most of the computing in the computers industry they were developing faster and faster there was a there in computing industry there is a law which is called moore's law and moore was a founder co-founder of intel and he predicted that every 18 months computation power of 
computers will double. And our, our industry has seen that trend happening since last 70 years. Computation power of every computer, if you see our mobile phone, they become, whenever you buy a second mobile phone, it becomes almost double the speed of the last one. Even the prices gets lower and the speed gets higher. And that is the trend that the computing, uh, computer industry has followed so far, which has led to this. Now, if I just tell you what exactly, uh, how, let's understand what are the terms what we have to understand before I talk about artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? Because if this is a, something which is technical topic, but it's more, it's made more technical, but when you start reading it, when you start understanding it, you will find there's not much into it. You'll find that it's, it's much, much easier than optometry or ophthalmology or optionary. Our subjects are more complicated, this is more simpler. And when I started to make it simple, I like to explain each and every definition in a very simple way. So first let me, what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is, is nothing but teaching a computer how to be smarter and how to think and act like, a, or mimic like a human. When you tell a computer, this is the way you have to act, think or behave like a human, this is the technology is all artificial intelligence. So in few words, teaching a computer to become a smarter is artificial intelligence. And what are the processes involved in it? First process involved is called machine learning. What is machine learning? When you teach a machine, when you teach a computer intelligently that this is a cat, a cat has a tail, cat has this color, cat could be brown, cat could be, uh, should have whiskers, cat, cat should be this size, cat should be that size. You know, when you tell it and give these commands to computer, the computer start to become, to recognize that cat after a certain time. It's just like when you teach children, same way if you teach a machine without computing, without giving, giving any calculations to it, that is called machine learning. You don't program it, but you tell a computer and the computer learns from the command what you give without giving any, you know, without giving your computing power, not computing power exactly, but without giving any program to it. So this is called machine learning. And what is deep learning? Deep learning is something that when you give data, when you give a picture to a computer to learn that this is a picture of diabetic retinopathy and more the picture you give, more the computer will become intelligent and more easy for it, it will be more easy for, for the computer will be to decide its power, to decide its diagnosis. So when you show a picture, this is called deep learning. And when you show only just the, when you give a verbal command, it is called machine learning. The third step comes your CNN, which is called conventional neural network. Conventional neural network is what is just like our brain. You know, we have so many neurons in our brain. Similarly, computers have so many neurons and they are connected with one layer, two layer, three layers. Larger the number of the layer will be, larger the better, the more intelligent the program will be. And this is called conventional network. Fourth is what is robotics. Robotics is same artificial intelligence and machine learning told to a computer to take the task of human. When a computer starts working like a human, which, which looks like a human, is called robotics. Then you have the term like what virtual reality, you have the term like augmented reality. These are the terms which we hear in low vision applications every day. And this is what I, I mean, they look very scientific, they look very technical. But what is virtual reality? Virtual reality is when a person is put into a virtual reality by cutting off from reality. Like what we have, you must have seen that when you go to a movie or when you go, when you start going and doing a, looking for a, to play a, a game on the television, you are given a device which you wear on your face and you are given a 360 degree virtual view 
and your brain is thick like your brain looks like as if you are just a human you are you are doing a you are doing a job without doubt all those things around you virtual reality is something a small device which is put on your face and you start to think that you are in a space you are doing some some activity virtual reality is application we have big in uh, in our low vision but what i recently saw is this that they are giving virtual reality training to medical students and in medical students thinks that he is in operation theater and doing a cpr when there is no one around him the patient is thinking that he is in operation theater patient is lying and the person is doing like this and he is learning the cpr on just virtual reality and what is artificial augmented reality augmented reality is this when a face of virtual reality is applied to you you must have seen the application when you saw those uh, transition lenses ap application that when you they have different colors you put a frame different colors comes one by one you you, you have seen that happening that uh, that application you, you can try cosmetic contact lenses without trying them on that's the word, that's the augmented reality you can just sit in front of a computer and different type of spectacle different type of sunglasses different type of contact lenses can be put without really putting them on is virtual reality is augmented reality so these are few terms what will be coming to more and more because if you are learning if you want have not if you have you have no choice because you must have to to learn these terms to understand artificial intelligence and this is going to become more and more important because when i will talk about it its application in optometry or eye care you will realize that that this is something what we must learn and what what the knowledge we must have well i think what i just want to tell you is this that uh, how development of artificial intelligence has taken up there are few i mean i'm just giving you the earmarks how the whole industry came up the first person who used the artificial intelligence term was in 1950 and his name was alan turing and he was the person who had this idea who gave this idea to the world can machine think and this was his concept and in 1956 there was another scientist from uh, from us he was he had the first conference of artificial intelligence and he said he gave he presented a paper on artificial intelligence and this john mccarthy is called the father of artificial intelligence and as i told you the progress happened from 1957 to 1974 computers were in a different stage computers were getting accessible computers were getting affordable by 1980s fifth generation of computer came by by 90s you saw emergence of data you saw the emergence of facial recognition by 2000 we saw speech recognition happening by 2000 in 1997 if you notice a uh, computer played the world champion uh, gary kasparov for a game of chess gary kasparov was the world ch uh, chess champion at that time and ibm ibm watson is the uh, watson is the company of ibm which challenged him to for a game and uh, they played a game and gary kasparov lost into the game but after the game he said that this is the technology will change everything and what we saw happening even in chess that the younger player they started to play with the computers more and they were champions who were at a younger age or in chess and the demographics of because previously the, the chess was being played in few countries chess was being played in more and more countries so this is how the application of artificial intelligence happens and it penetrates deeper and deeper into the rest of the world and that is why even india is able to like we are not the leaders but at least we are at number 10 position at this point of time that is what we are advantage of artificial intelligence is that the technology of the first world can be used by third world countries at the same cost but at a lower cost
And that is what artificial intelligence is. Today, six companies from US, I'll give you the name, I'm sure all of you know, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, and DeepMind. These six companies and four companies from China, this is Baidu, Tencent, and uh, Alibaba, and there's one more company, iFlyCat. These 10 companies have 90% of artificial intelligence share, and they are developing most of the startups in, and they have the maximum share of artificial intelligence in all the applications. So this is what, uh, and wh what I want to tell you about ophthalmology and why it fascinates us, why we should be proud of it, that after, we were the ophthalmology was the first field to adopt or you to take a credit from this because in 2018 idxdr was the first fda approved healthcare app for detection and diabetes of retinopathy and that's what i was telling dr nirtajan that he was a retina specialist and he owns a uh, this company is called digital diagnostics and uh, when they came out in 2018 the fda uh, was approved I wrote to them and I asked them, what are your plans to come to India? They said that we need to meet the regulatory authorities before we come to any countries. And by the way, you must know that the artificial intelligence is not just picking any country, coming to that country. Artificial intelligence involves is research or a subject should be from a particular instrumentation. They said that our FDA approval is on only on top one. We cannot detect diabetic retinopathy of an instrument done on forest or any other retinal camera. So we need to understand that it's not this rocket science. It's not something that can apply anywhere. If, because it's a computer, it's not a human. It's not a, it's not a ophthalmologist that he will read any image, whatever quality, whatever it is. It's an image, if the quality of the image is not good, if the pixels are not in the same machines, if the colors are not in the same machine, it will reject and it will fail. That's what the, beauty of technology is. So my, I'll wait for five minutes and uh, I think uh, if any of you can, uh, Monica want to introduce the academy, I'll be back after five minutes and we will talk about what op is the artificial intelligence application. In first, we'll talk about opticianery, what is the, how it, how opticians can take advantage from it, how optometrists can take advantage of it, third, how ophthalmologists can take advantage of it, and fourth is how it can affect our population, which is which is uh, visually impaired. It has the best application for patients with visual impairment, which India has not yet explored. And this is what we need to see. That's what I said that this is our eye care delivery will change once we apply artificial intelligence to it. So I will need Monica. Monica, are you around? Yes, I am here. So yes. can you just talk about academy? I'll be back in five minutes, and then I will talk about application of artificial intelligence in, uh, op, 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 in eye care. In fact, you set the ball rolling. It's really okay. exciting. So just now. five minutes, I'll be back. We're really excited and we wanted to know, yes, what is going to come in. We've been talking about it. We have seen our younger generation oh. dealing Sorry. with it. Do you want to introduce the academy or Dr. Nathazani, if he's there, he can talk about his artificial intelligence uh, uh, experiences. And then I will talk about opticians. We'll take up the question answers, but till then, I would request Oli, who is going to be leading this uh, academy, to come forward and brief the audience about what is coming up in future in India in terms of education and how a group of young minds and young leaders who have come together to build up this, um, uh, to evolve into bringing up better education to the professionals in the country. So I think Oli, you would be the best person who's framing up this academy to come forward and tell us and um, motivate all of us to be part of it. Yep. Uh, good evening all. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, the introduction and uh, giving this opportunity to uh, talk about this new academy that we are trying to form about. So as we all know that uh, there is no standardized protocol uh, or a definite organization in India who is working pan-India basis for pure upliftment of our 
optometry community it's more uh, of political or some kind of educational things are happening so what we thought of a group of young uh, people uh, with the guidance of obviously mentors like you ajit sir and rajesh sir and many more uh, so what we thought of to form an academy and then uh, to support a continuous education and then at the same time we should advance into our optometric practice to improve the patient care as the optometry field is uh, constantly changing so we, we should be ready to adopt those new changes and that can be only possible by mean of continuous training training and research work so this academy which we intend to form is purely work on uh, non political affairs of the optometry which is going to be uh, lectures and workshops uh, organizing symposiums offering fellowships uh, conducting webinars across uh, uh, like uh, webinars with uh, eminent faculties across the globe and then also uh, like publishing scientific literatures uh, to have our own online journal so those components are also going to be there apart from this for the students we do in research in presentations posters and then also guide them through how to publish on scientific journals so with this core aspect uh we wish to form this academy with the blessings from all the mentors and with the help of with our right minded people colleagues and friends so we look forward to welcome you all on this board who has uh, uh we will be definitely standardizing the criteria of uh being part of fellows or a member of that academy which will be uh publicly announced soon so with this i wish to hand over to monica ma'am thank, thank you thank you so much ali our wishes and blessings to you always um in fact if you could even put it up in the chat box once we announce and uh, people can if they have any queries questions or the love to be calm the membership once we open up we will have you see um, if you look at the developed countries and they have always had these kind of academies which have led forward the profession and have moved ahead it's very good initiative to see india also bringing up that initiative where students educators and professionals will be together to bring in this learning thank you ali uh, welcome back uh, mr ajit bhardwaj yes i we keen to waiting for you to come back after that break because okay. we we are really now looking forward to where is in artificial intelligence going to take us and the time is uh, of course now interdisciplinary an optometrist cannot just think that he has to read through only optometry the the time even the education policy is only talking about multidisciplinary learning so as you say i i as an educator look forward to having uh, this kind of a course or a module into our curriculums so that every optometrist is getting prepared for the future we have to read through law we have to read through ethics we have many more things to learn and definitely the time says the the only if you want to be narrow focused in your own domain this is not going to bring in success to everybody so it might sound odd for all the optometrists today thinking that why this topic of artificial intelligence we are not computer professionals why are we talking we are not engineers but this is where we have to grow in we have to improve our mindset to change into a multidisciplinary affair so next we would like to hear from you how you going to integrate it into optometry or what comes in for an optician optometrist and even an ophthalmologist okay thank you monica i would uh, just uh, i'm sure that my uh, many of you may not have understood what exactly artificial intelligence is because it takes certain time to understand the subject any new subject 
but what i want to tell you is just that if you just read it or hear it again you will get most of it you will hear most of it what is it supply what does artificial intelligence do to healthcare it works on three aspect it works speed of delivery it gives you the diagnosis within earliest possible time it is means it is quick number 2 it is accurate it is reliable and number 3 it is cost effective so most of the interventions what i will be talking about whether it is for opticians whether it is for optometrists or whether it is for ophthalmologists my is my talk will be talk i mean i'll be focusing on devices or applications which are least and least which involves least cost and gives you right interventions and where does it come from it comes from technology and after my talk you will start loving your mobile phone more than what you love just now okay let me tell you what how it can help opticians to adopt artificial intelligence you saw what i talked about augmented reality it's a layer virtual layer on a reality what does it can help for opticians i have seen in many show windows in europe they don't have any sunglass or any frame in the show window they have a screen and when somebody is crossing the screen his face will crop up on the screen and when your face come on your on any screen you like to stop and see what is why my face is here and then you will see some certain glass sunglasses appearing one by one on his face this is the application of artificial intelligence in opticians for a show window you can put a screen tv screen you can put it as small as as large as you can put a ipad ipad is bit small but put a device a new show window in any area where you wish you are seeing most frequently your visitor comes and it's a curiosity when your own face appears you will stop and try those sunglasses without it really you know trying them on number two technology i tell you is called intelligent mirror what is intelligent mirror is it is an ipad whereby your best selling frames are already programmed into it your ten your latest arrival is already there and the person stands in front of the ipad and whichever sunglass he wants to try he can get the 3d view in it and he sees himself in it more smart better and you know with more makeup that's why it is called intelligent makeup intelligent mirror it makes you even you know it gives you certain kind of uh, foundation on your face certain better it make you know makes your face better by artificial intelligence and put makes your sunglasses looks better than what he will be already looking this is the application you can put in an ipad without much investment even the first one just need the cost of the hardware the software investment is not much the third investment i want to tell you about is 3d virtual try on now we have used in our website that you can put your on your website certain frames or glasses you want to sell and person can sit in front in his house and he can try them one by one you must have seen the one by lens card that's a very expensive uh, proposition but what art augmented reality can do at a very lower cost that you can try them virtually trying them at 3 degree angle without really trying them so a patient don't need to come to you, come to us website link can be sent just by adding augmented reality into it i have done to my website if i have sent if any of you want interested interested i can send you the link you can try my frame sunglasses i know you will not buy but try it fourth thing is finding out the spectacle power using your mobile phone you know we use expensive lensometers today you can download two apps which i tell you they not available one is not available so you have to try using some technology into it because there is a device if an app is not available in your country you can still download it you have to contact a techie guy he will download that app these two apps you can name that i can give you the this is something very interesting for all optometrists For all opticians, for all ophthalmologists, if they don't want to invest in a lensometer to check the power of your glasses, you can look for these two apps. Look for look on this one app is called one app is called Lens Scanner, 
and other app is six over six. Six over six will soon be in India because this has been um, technology has been patented by a company from Israel, and Lenskart has tied up with them to come to bring this technology to India. So very soon they will be advertising this concept to public. So once it is open to public, you can also use the technology to take out your spectral power without really having a lensometer in your workshop or in your clinic or in your office, anywhere you are. Next intelligent application of artificial intelligence is called iTint. What does iTint do? It checks your visible light coming to your eyes through your sunglasses. You know, when we use certain sunglasses, we don't realize how much dark it is, how much light we are getting. So by applying this application called eye tint, you can measure amount of light coming to your eyes. You know that sometimes there was a time I was traveling to Chandigarh, I did not realize my lenses, my windscreen, my side glasses of the car were tinted and I was chilled out. So this technology, if I had the technology, I could measure it whether it is in a permissible limit to tint to have that tint in my car or not. So this eye tint can measure those transmission of light through the lens or through the optical surface, whether it is practical or glass or any surface. It's another app developed by Polaroid called Polaroid UV. What Polaroid UV does, it measures, the, it tells you the amount of UV light in the atmosphere at a particular time how much UV you have when you are going out. It will warn your customer, it will prompt them to buy sunglasses if the UV light is very high at this particular time. It will guide you, all your patient that UV light is where you can tell them, see, this is the UV light at this particular time when you are going out. So this is, you can download that app called Polaroid UV and you will know that Polaroid, by doing that, you can sell more sunglasses in your shop. There's an app called Contact Lens, Tracker, because sometimes, or most of the times, we tell the patients to come back after 30 days to, to, to get their supply, and they forget and you forget. You can tell the patient to download that app called Lens Contact Lens Tracker, which will remind the person that my lenses are going to be all, to be finished on this particular day, and I have to. They will be reminding that person again and again, and he will be prompted to come to you to place your order of contact lenses. So these are the some of the applications which I, then there's an app which is developed by Alcon, which is called Eye Color Studio. Alcon's uh, air optics contact lenses, you can try all of those without really trying them on. You patients sometimes want to say, oh, you, I want to try this lens. Can I really, can you give me a trial of these contact lenses? And sometimes you say, oh, sorry, we don't have the trial for cosmetic because you know, it's a waste to us. And, we don't really keep a trial. It's very difficult to keep a trial inventory for cosmetic contact lenses. So this is a company, Alcon has already done this. So you can download this app, which is Air Optics Color, which is called Color Studio. And uh, you can, your patients, and you can uh, try those contact lenses without really trying them on. I was in, uh, when I was in Shenzhen, I really saw certain uh, companies uh, selling uh, cosmetic. And there was no salesperson around. And I saw those females, what ha was happening is just that they were standing in front of an iPad and they were touching a particular, this, li this lipstick, this foundation, and this blush, and this eye makeup. And artificial intelligence will put everything on their face without really trying them. This app is called Makeup. Most of the most of people who use selfie, who use, you know, more fan, who are fond of making themselves beautiful and send their pictures on Facebook and, you know, different social medias, they really don't put that trial on, but just by trying that contact, but just by trying that application, the app is called Makeup. So you can try, you can suggest to your patients before they try sunglasses, that try makeup first. After that, you try my sunglasses or glasses, and then they'll be more interested in making that purchase for you. So these are a few applications which I feel can help artificial intelligence to, for a, from an optical point of view, only from retail perspective. Artificial intelligence has bigger application in tracking your customer's behavior, in prompting, in, in telling them, if you look at their behavior, how and when they purchase and what they purchase by putting all those data in your computer and coming out, you can come out your best selling frame, your best selling price, your best buying customers, and all this intelligence is available. And if it's not available, it can be made available uh, 
by by your little bit of effort now i'll come to what actually we can do for optometry and ophthalmology what are the options for optometry and ophthalmology of artificial intelligence i'll be talking about few you know the apps if you look at there's a research done on various apps particularly in healthcare apps and the accuracy of app goes from 7% to 98% which app you should go for more particularly in healthcare you need to see who is the developer of the app whether the app is certified by fda or ce or the developer is a really qualified either a professional or a qualified data analyst today you know what is the worst best paying job in the world data scientist and data analyst they are the highest paid people more than doctors lawyers and in the profession in the world today and they are the most demand today so look for the data scientists who have really worked look at their and look look at the person who has made that app possible or make that who has produced that app so i would suggest that don't use any app without looking at the reviews look at the reviews read the reviews read its certification its validation is more important than really an app so i will tell you app which i have really found that yes this is the app which uh, these are something what are worth looking at and some of those some of you may really i'm not saying them to buy them because there some of them are paid app some of them are free app free apps so you have to see what really you have to do it at your own risk let me put it that way don't could put to tell me later that you applied this didn't work it may not work because i have not tried all of them but i have read i've seen their authenticity and then only i'm recommending it to you after reading 15 ad apps i'm telling you one because i have read 15 of them to identify one one which is i'm telling you today this app called go check eyes this app is for children who or children or adult when you want to check their vision and this is the app this stands for 10 feet distance and how does it work is this you tell the app you you ask the height of the person because nobody knows how much how much is 10 feet or how much is 3 meters you ask the distance ask the height of the person the person will tell you okay my height is 5 feet it has a frame and once you put that person in the frame of spectic of your iphone once you download the app a frame will appear a human frame will appear put that person in the frame and then that means the distance when you either ask him to forward or backward once the person is within the frame it means he, this distance is 10 feet the technology has measured the 10 feet and then you start ask the person to read and then you can measure his distance visual acuity and the app is certified by fta and so you don't need to invest money and you don't need to go to a dark room to measure the visual acuity so this app is very popular very good called go check eyes the next app is the second app which i'm telling you is developed by the same company and this app was developed by the guy who invented oct his name is david hawk and he is because the when a person is of that the person who invented oct i doubt and his this app also is fda and ce both approved and this app is so good it is to detect refractive error in amblyopia in children who are non verbal it means the below 4 years of age if you take the picture of the child the algorithm the the artificial intelligence will tell you from by analyzing it whether the some the seeing the corneal reflexes whether the child has amblyopia or whether the child has refractive error you don't need anything else just take a picture of the per child this app is used by most pediatricians not by most ophthalmologists or most optometrists 4500 pediatricians they use this app so look for this app is not available here but as i told you you can download it by downloading by showing your giving your mobile phone to some techie and he will download that app for you it's called go check eyes go check eyes go check kids first was go check eyes the second is go check kids 
third app i will recommend you is called i exam it measures visual acuity it measures color blindness it measures astigmatism and it measures the which eye is your dominant eye you know you don't need to because when you are in a primary care setup i have seen the infrastructure the instrumentation and the facilities they have so when you are in a primary center or primary place or as a primary eye care profession you need to see technologies which are validated which are approved which are cheaper which are affordable and which can be applied to public so look for these applications and you will find that some of them may work for you this one more app which is called cradle c r a d l e it's called white eye doctor cradle stands for c r stands for computer a stands for assisted d stands for diagnosis l stands for leuco leucoporia bolo sir hello computer assisted device for leucoporia so by look by taking the picture of a child this application this uh, artificial intelligence algorithm can measure all this your pediatric cataract your retinoblastoma your corneal opacities your corneal uh, scarring just by taking the picture of the child and using the algorithm good thing of artificial intelligence is it is just like a human doctor that more and more you use more and more we give them images more intelligent they become you know china there is a there is a they have created a robot which is called medical doctor and this doctor was asked to sit this robot was asked to sit just like we have the exam for doctors before they ask to before they are like uh, before they are allowed to practice similarly china has an exam and this robot was asked to appear in an exam and he passed that medical exam so you can see the intelligence of computer or intelligence of robot is can be matched with that of a human so we have to understand that we need to not be scared of the technology but adopt the technology to our advantages then there are certain apps which are for effective alerts which i have already discussed some of you already if you have attended my previous lectures you must have seen um, my uh, lectures on not on the effective error on telehealth i will just give you there certain instruments like there is some instrument which are which I, was, I i shared it to you earlier it is uh, this for effective error device for effective error measurement subjectively it measures gives very accurate results very reliable we have tried it on many patients and it is called iq works very well with your iphone this it cost much just 60 dollars give it send it to the patient patient can do it himself and measure is effective error there are more of the devices which i this one by i netra but that's an expensive one that's a order refractor and uh, measures objectively it's not subjective then there's one by adaptica is a new company from italy they have come out with a device uh, called tubin which is again for pediatric group it's very good in the sense that you measure the same just check his uh, take his photograph of his eyes and it will detect your effective error status it will detect whether you have keratoconus it will detect whether you have amblyopia it will detect all your uh, uh, you know it will measure the reflexes measure your heterophoria measure your heterotopia give you estimate of that what else you want just by taking a picture using that instrument and they have another instrument from adoptica called kaleidoscope this is for elderly population the first one is a portable device it's just like a camera a doctor called to win the second is kaleidoscope which is fixed in a clinic whereby you can scan so all those things you don't need to create a dark room just within a space of 1 meter you can measure all those uh, things this most interesting app which i love is called idoc which is for every optometry for every optical optometry student good for every opticians too 
for ophthal ophthalmologist too. Why? Because iDoc, if you download it, it tells you all about any contact lens from any manufacturer. It tells you what is the power, in which range the manufacturer makes it, what is the brand, what is the water content, what is the diameter in which it is made, what is the base curve, what is the curve, what is your your water content, what is uh, decay by T, and what is the modality, just from this application. So you don't need to remember what is the what are the access made by the company in this particular uh, by in this particular you know model because sometimes I see our optometrists ordering and the manufacturer does not have the, those angles the manufacturer did not make them so you will know the access whatever it is available it does all the calculation of your back contact lens calculations for your vertex power. What if your spectacle power is this, what should be the ordered contact lens power? It will measure your diopter, it will turn, it will convert your diopter to millimeter and vice versa. Third, it will uh, tell you the axis, you know, closest axis, what you can order. So this app application, which is called iDoc, E-Y-E-D-O-C, will be very good, I uh, mean, for many of you, because you don't need to remember different, uh, companies, different products, different modalities, different uh, parameters in your brain and uh, just uh, easy to just uh, check what is available with the manufacturer. Then the same app has all the medicines name, what is the trade name, what is the generic name, what is the chemical in it, only the topical eye drops. So this is something what I would, uh, I would see that, you know, it may be good for you. And uh, this app called Eye Calculator, which turns your Snell and Vision to Logmar to Decimal and vice versa. So Eye Calculator is something if you want to convert three of these uh, conversions, just by if you have Snell and want to convert, you can do that. This one uh, more I want to remind you about called when we, most of the time when we ask give vision therapy, or patients forget, you know, whether to do it or not to do it. And uh, this is something which will be very good for uh, only, it's called My Therapy Reminder my, and Pill Tracker. What does it do is just that it reminds the person this is the time to do therapy. And this is the time to take medication. It does both, both the works for therapy and taking the medication at a particular time. So these are the something what uh, what you can what uh, you can suggest to your patient there is an app called pill reminder by a company called medisafe it, for the chronic patients of glaucoma who either miss or they use twice or diabetic retinopathy sometimes they take sometimes they will take the twice the medication sometimes they will just take once so these are the application called pill reminder by medisafe is the very safe uh, application for those patients who are on the chronic drugs and there's one application which uh, I would suggest for, for some of you who may be interested. It's called VRX, W-E-R-X. Whatever you prescribe, it will tell you which chemist in your locality is giving you cheaper. It will give you comp cheaper comparative analysis of all the medicine in your, in your locality. This is something what is, is great in the sense that it is good for... Uh, patients and once it is good for patients it's good for you also i know many of the ophthalmologists they have the pharmacy within their premises but if you don't have suggest this app and the patient can take benefit of that this patient who are colorblind there's an application called colorblind helper and uh, all the patients with color blindness you can help them they will be able to know the colors because this application is one download loaded has 15 colors you show your camera to it and it will tell you the exact color so the patient is not confused. And same application, sometimes a child is colorblind and mother wants to know what the child is seeing. So mother can download the app called Color Deep Blind. It means the mother can use that application and know what your child is seeing, which color the child is seeing. So this is something that two applications, one can be used to understand or to see what person is seeing and the other is just that how you can really recognize the particular color. For community work, for most ophthalmologists, 
some of these things, some of these applications which I'm going to tell you will be of interest. This app is called Jula, V-U-L-A. It's developed by a, by, by a ophthalmologist from South Africa. And uh, he's a retina specialist again, but he developed an app for cataract detection. And hereby, again, if you just take a picture and send it to the algorithm, send it to apply artificial intelligence, and this will measure, this will tell you whether you have cataract or not. It's an application for primary health centers and similar work is done by MIT, from Massachusetts University, and they developed something similar like this. This is the only difference is this is of white color and that device is of red color. And you apply this to your phone and just like, you know, when we detect this, um, uh, the previous app, Eula, does not give you the grading of the application. It just tells you the cataract, mild, moderate, or severe care, or you know, mature cataract. But this application, which I'm telling you, is uh, called CATRA. And if you want to read more, read about iCatra.com, E-Y-E-C-A-T-R-A.com. What it does is this, just like the slit lamp, you know, you use the light, you use the back, back scattering light and measure the, the density of the cataract and location of the cataract. Similarly, this, this device will measure the location of the cataract, density of the cataract in different eight quadrants and tell you the exact grading of the cataract. So this is something very interesting. And as I told you, the website, which is developed by you know, some MIT and US, and something could be, this could be good for community, particularly EULA and this, because cataract is something which we have, we spend a lot of time. Let me tell you, we may have a lot of optometrists and a lot of ophthalmologists, but we will never have enough that they can screen. We will never get enough people to screen. So we need technologies to screen people. We may, we may have enough to treat and manage and you know, provide solutions. But if you say that, okay, we'll have sufficient human resource to do the retinal exam and to do the cataract screening and this, we never, you need to find a technology to replace people to find, to be done in a very cost-effective way so that our patients can reach to us in time. So the app like Katra, app like Jula, or Katak or something is very great. This app is called iPro. I have not used, I don't have much knowledge, but ophthalmologists use, use it for calculating by using the biometry. They use it for calculation of IOL and the um, toric IOL. I don't have much information, much knowledge about it. I just read it and I thought that maybe any of you who is interested, you can note, it's called E-Y-E-P-R-O, it's called iPro. This, uh, the Cataract Boost is an application, is an artificial intelligence application, which is developed by six major uh, NGOs, and they are big ones in the sense this, uh, uh, IAPB is involved, International Council of Ophthalmology is involved, Arvind Eye Hospital is involved. Orbis is involved and uh, Fred, Fred Holo Foundation. So these six foundations, they have created this application called Cataract Boost. This is to measure the efficiency of a surgeon for cataract operation. That what happens in, in most of our population that um, the, the baby or camps work that we call patients to our clinic for surgery or to the hospital, but patient doesn't turn up after for the follow-up procedures. And the follow-up we do is after such a long time that we don't really get a feedback on how the surgery was done. So Cathec Boost is a program, is an artificial intelligence software that measures your performance. The surgeon can measure its performance by getting a report from the patient just on his, on his mobile phone. I'm sure many ophthalmologists who wants to work, who are working in a community could be interested. And they can look at this application called and they can read more on going to this uh, website or www.cataractboost.org. www.cataractboost.org. Read more on this and uh, I'm sure that you can compare your results, you can improve your results 
by undergoing all these things. For glaucoma, I have, we have some um, interesting application for for community, and uh, some of the good ones are Lumus, L-U-M-U-S, Lumus app. It's again a very inexpensive device, which is attached to your mobile phone, takes the picture of your or mobile, takes the picture of your retina, and from your uh, cup to disc ratio gives you the probable risk of glaucoma and uh, it's widely used and quite popular. It's called Lumus applications. And likewise, you can measure, you can download an application. If you don't have visual field in the community, you can download this application called Visual Field Easy on your mobile phone or your not mobile phone, but your iPad. And on your iPad, you can measure the patient's visual field without investing into a perimeter or without buying any software or without buying any other device. Visual field easy. So these are the, some of the applications which I feel that uh, could uh, be used. And then there's one application which is good for uh, uh, ophthalmology for glaucoma and uh, retinal diseases is called Pegasus, whereby 2D, 3D image of the retina is and, and OCT is, come, is taken into consideration and patient is, uh, by using the artificial intelligence, patient is diagnosed whether he has the uh, diabetic retinopathy or macular degeneration or glaucoma and whether the patient needs a referral or not. So for glaucoma, I told you there's a called uh, uh, the Lumus, there's a Pegasus and which I told you about the measuring of a visual field without any investment is uh, Visual field dot made easy. Then coming back to the main topic where the artificial intelligence, uh, sorry, one more application which was, uh, which uh, is called for measuring UVITs, is called UV Meet, UVE MET, UV Master, UVE MASTER. This was developed by a, a person who specialized, who really worked in, uh, is from Madrid University. He's a, a, again an ophthalmologist and he worked extensively on UVIDIS. And by using differential diagnosis, by taking those pictures, sending those uh, to the artificial intelligence, his, his accuracy was 97.7%. Uh, I used the 97.7% accuracy to diagnose uh, your UVIDIS. Most interesting thing for optometrist is uh, the eyes, you know. This is something emerging in the sense that optometrist can really participate in it. Though we, we use uh, Schirmer test to measure the quantity of tears in your eyes. We, we use uh, uh, two dyes, uh, fluorescein and uh, uh, lizamine, and we use uh, for measuring the quality beauty test to see how your tear will operate. The best application what I have seen is there's a device which, because both, the, if you look at the system, you know, you're putting those two uh, filter, you know, I mean, two pieces of paper in somebody's eyes looks very, very invasive to me. And I'm sure that there's a device like a small camera called thermal, uh, infrared thermal camera. This gives you in a second, a measurement of your uh, eyes and tells you whether the patient has a dry eye or not. They have done they have done a lot of pictures of the patients because once they come out with those diagnoses, they have already fed into the computer. Just take the pictures. This camera is not expensive. It's just like the COVID camera. Just we take the temperature from the skin, you take a temperature from the eyes, but it, besides the temperature, it takes the, it gives you the image of the eye also and tells you what the temperature is. And the patients who are having a lower temperature, they may have normal, uh, normal uh, tears uh, circulation and those with the higher are diagnosed for the eyes because there's no tear in the eye. So some of those uh, to detect is for keratogonus. You know, we need to understand that as an optometrist, you have the patient comes to you for his thinking is a refractive error. You are the first point of contact just by measuring the doing a small uh, topography, just by measuring the K rating, you can get the K, whether the person has a keratogonus. Feeding that into the computer, com uh, into the algorithm, you can dis you can uh, decide whether the patient has a keratogonus or not. And as you know, for the success of keratogonus, earlier you do the C3R, earlier you diagnose the patient for C3R, 
earlier it is better for you and better for patients. I'm sure many of the young uh, students of optometry, they just rush to, I mean, looking at uh, contact lenses. And But I would suggest that even before you put the contact lenses, C3R will be very, very helpful in the sense that it gives you strength and rigidity to the cornea, you know, by making the cornea more rigid. And uh, you know the term C3R stands for some of the optometry students. Just know, you know I mean, C3R is, uh, I mean, cross-linking of corneal, uh, Cornea by using riboflavin. So, start uh, detecting the contact keratoconus. Again, those two devices which I tell, told you earlier to win just by looking at the by pupil reaction, the, uh, the, the diagnosis for keratoconus can come. So, this again device by using uh, or your, uh, your top of the patient can come to, you can detect the keratoconus or not. IDXDR, as I told you earlier, this was the first application which was granted by FDA for uh, for any first first healthcare app which was approved by FDA, and this is something which we should be proud of in the sense that uh, uh, the device could uh, detect diabetic retinopathy. It could give you a referral for whether the patient has uh, need to be sent to ophthalmologist. It could tell whether the patient needs to be sent to ophthalmologist immediately or not. So it could decide and it could identify the risk of diabetes and guide the patients within the shortest possible time just by sending the retinal image to the, to the cloud. And uh, there's a work which is done on the same, same thing, which was done by Google. And uh, this was in collaboration with Arvind and Shankar Nitale. And they did a lot of work on the same subject and they come out with some better results in the sense that uh, uh, they analyzed almost 130,000 uh, images and came out with diagnosis and they, they could very successfully give the diff grading for patients who did not have diabetes, who have mild to moderate to severe to proliferative by, use, by going through that algorithm. But what interesting part was that they wanted to compare that algorithm with the human. And uh, I saw the interview of Lily Peng. Lily Peng was the data scientist who was involved in this program. And I saw her interview once on uh, television. And she told you, she, she, I mean, she told, she told in the interview that the biggest challenge was that when we were doing the analysis, because images were sent by, by these two hospitals, Arvind and Shankara, but they used 54 ophthalmologists from US to decide what is the grading done. But the challenge was that most of the time they said that they had all the 54, they agreed when it, there was no diabetes or when a, there was a proliferative diabetes, diabetic retinopathy. But there was a lot of confusion when it came to grading. We said that 65% of the time, most of the retina specialists did not agree with the, with the colleague. And sometimes it so happened that the same image which was sent, which was given to the same retina specialist the next day, he changed his decision. So this led them to decide that it needs more of a, like they decided this, uh, I mean, artificial intelligence, they, they, they went by majority when a decision came that this particular is from mild or this is moderate. They decided to go with the majority and then graded it accordingly. And after that, then the algorithm came up with the very interesting facts that uh, they came out with a wonderful, uh, but this is not uh, this is not yet accredited or certified by any agency, just like IDXDR has been. Uh, but after that, they again work with the with those those images, and they could come out with and predict what most of the ophthalmologists has never seen. They could tell gender of a patient from looking at the retina. And they also diagnosed cardiovascular risks by looking at the retina. They also diagnosed neural Alzheimer just by looking at the retina. And also they could predict whether the person has a refractive error or not just by looking at the retina. So all those five things, they came up much later. First, basic, basic, was, basic research was on diabetic but all this diabetic retinopathy, but all this development like patients age, patients, you know, smoke, I mean, after analyzing the, 
all those uh, his cardiovascular risk, whether the patient will get a stroke in five years to come or not. So all those things came out as subsequent research of Google following you. If any of you must have seen Mr. Sundar Pichai's interview, and he told much later, I mean, this result, this waiting was done earlier, but the, he came out with the research much later. He told much later that they are doing this research to, to, uh, for cardiovascular risk, which is something very, very interesting uh, for, uh, for ophthalmologist and for retina specialist that since most of the time they are not seeing the patient and they, their retinal images are only coming. So it's all these risks which are diagnosed by algorithm or the artificial intelligence will help them, help them to give better decisions on this. Then comes your macular degeneration. That's the last disease which I'll be talking to you about. Uh, there's a device which is based on virtual reality, which is again like playing the game, which I told you earlier. You put, up, you put yourself as if you are in a dark room and it measures your dark room adaptation. There's an artificial intelligence uh, assistant that is attached to the, to the device and which guides you how to do it, what to do it, and it measures your visual acuity in 360 degree vision and diagnose and monitors your ARMD. And uh, as you know, that uh, biggest challenge for uh, us, again, as I told you earlier, whether it is, uh, whether it is diabetic retinopathy or whether it is AMD, is their diagnosis and the screening part. Most of the time, the quality of images or the screening is not accurate or the instrument what we use, they are not good enough. I have seen um, some good development happening around and I'm sure that it will be of interest to many of uh, all of us in the sense that I saw one inst instrument recently launched, uh, which is uh, called uh, DRS by Eye Care, which is good, one of the best retinal cameras whereby you don't, anybody doesn't need any training, any, you don't need any dark room. You just ask the patient to sit for 40 seconds in front of, uh, of a retinal camera. And it gives you, even if you have a small opacity or a pupil size is even about 2.5 millimeter, it gives you very good result. Only thing is the is prohibitive, the cost. So I'm sure that in time to come, there'll be many more companies and the prices of this will come down and once Excuse me. <clears throat> Once the prices come down, the screening of, of uh, they can be you know multiplied and they can be scaled up to a level and help uh, more diabetic retinos retinopathy screen. So AMD, I will talk about the work of uh, uh, of Moorfield Hospital on AMD. They have done the best work for. Uh, what is OCT is, you know, OCT is, a, is very the most important tool for diagnosis of any uh, retinal uh, fluid, retinal diseases. And uh, they are the one who have taken the lead in the sense that they work with the company of Google called DeepMind. And again, uh, they sent a lot of images to, to DeepMind and they could come out with diagnosis for 10 diseases earlier. And later on, they came out to explain that they, they could diagnose as many as 50 retinal diseases from the OCT. For optometry student, to be, to be precise, you know, OCT is what? OCT is nothing. It's a simple, uh, just like it's an X-ray without the deviation. It gives you three-dimensional view of retina. And what is important for them, the basic importance is this, that there should not be fluid in the retina. And that is the safest thing you need to look for wherever there is slight swelling, just send it to ophthalmologist. Because we, they have also experienced a similar uh, trend in, um, in Moorfield Hospital. They said that when we started screening them, they got a lot of false positive in the sense that they got almost 8,000 patients every month for, for diagnosis of uh, ARMD. And out of them, only 8, 10% had ARMD. So these are the, the challenges when we start, but I'm sure time everyone develops and uh, technology develops and uh, the, we are able to do more, better, quicker diagnosis at a lower cost. One more uh, applications of uh, ARMD, what, uh, what I would like to share is uh, one of the good developer from, he's from Nigeria, 
He is again a retina specialist. He is called uh, Dr. Stephen Odiaba. He is based out of Houston. And one thing good with most of the retina specialists who have done their applications, all they, they have done on the artificial intelligence. When I saw their profile, most of them were uh, data scientists as well. Which is something which is need to come to optometry as well as come to ophthalmology as well. That we only think the profession from our angle. But uh, there's much more to it. And uh, what fascinated me more about this something, uh, what they're doing at Moorfield is that those ophthalmologists who were involved in it, now they started to work in a different manner in the sense that they are using, they don't have computer knowledge like, like those techies or those uh, data scientists. But there are a lot of uh, open softwares open softwares uh, which is called auto ml and these softwares don't need any programming or any kind of mathematical calculations what we need to do is just that we need to get pictures most which most of the hospitals will have access to most of the if it, you don't have access to you can choose the picture from the open source you, you can choose the picture from the cloud because if you just want to see today okay show me a picture of glaucoma uh, disc you will get Hundred pictures on the on the on your computer, so just get those pictures and start feeding into them. This is what this is glaucoma. This is non glaucoma. This is this. This is diabetic retinopathy. And then that algorithm you can develop just without any kind of much training into it. So my suggestions to or my challenge to all the optometry and interested ophthalmology graduates is that start to look into if you have kind of a way of collecting big data, because that is what is more important. You start to work in the sense that you can develop your own software. I'm not saying to use them, but start using them, start making those at least and see what kind of result you get. And maybe start validating them from time to time and sooner you will improve uh, and we, we, we can uh, we can do better better diagnosis from our own source without really looking at big uh, uh, data scientists and big software uh, applications. So I think this is what I had to say about uh, optometry and AI applications uh, uh, in eye care for opticians, optometrists and ophthalmologists. And now last part is the rehabilitation. So, Monica, you can decide if you all have uh, sufficient strength to sit or only you can decide or will we take the rehabilitation at the next level or we can finish it today. I, I, I'm okay. I can do it. So, Monica, right. over to you. Because yeah. rehabilitation is again 15-20 minutes of because best application of artificial intelligence is for low vision patients. And you will see that how we can help low vision patients without giving them those expensive devices which we have been selling to them and they have not been really working for them. I so, do agree that you have over bombarded us with the knowledge. <laughs> it is bad kuch hai or itna kuch interesting hai that mine is really framing up into the things ye bhi, ye bhi, and before we could note down you moved on to the next things. We we'll love to repeat listen to your lecture. I think if you can quickly sum up the low vision part also so that the, the topic completes itself. And yes, we can have detailed discussion. We can have chat box. Uh, we can have messages from friends where they would like to know more about it. But I think it's worth taking up next. May not be 15 minutes, but a quick review of at least uh, some of the low vision things because that's the subject which interests me most. And you see, uh, okay, artificial intelligence have, uh, you know, help help in the sense that given di diagnosis to, to optometrist and ophthalmologist, but it has given solutions to solutions to patients with a low vision. And that is what is fascinating in the sense and that is what is interesting. And again, at a cost which is very, which is almost negligible. If you look at most of the applications of um, patients of low vision, and it has application in the sense that things which never occurred to us came out as a solution. See, your mobile device, as I told you, most of the application, they use this. And for patients with low vision today, they really 
I had demonstrated this earlier also. The applications in your mobile phone called Siri in Apple Alexa on your uh, uh, you know on your device and Cortona is again by Microsoft. So these are the three assistant which is available for any patient with a low vision, and you get to know each and everything through them. If I want to ask Siri, what is the time? What is the temperature? Where where I am? I want to go here. All the directions and all the responses are available for patients with the low vision on through your which which I call which I spoke to earlier called language processing. So that language processing, if one most of the time patients don't know optometrists don't know that this application is available for low vision patients. Then there is a device or a, uh, the, what you have in your mobile mobile phone is talkback and voiceover. What it does is this: whatever is in the screen of your mobile phone, Android have uh, is the they, they can look and they will find people with, with Android phones. They will find uh, in their setting talkback, and the iOS or iPhone users will find voiceover. So whatever is in your screen will be heard, will be read out loud by the by the by your mobile phone. So you don't need to really see, but you just need to hear and. Use, I mean, I, through the verbal hearing, you can read exactly what whatever the whether it's an email or whether it's a text received from anyone. Then, the one of the biggest or best application of uh, artificial intelligence is developed by Microsoft, and uh, this application is free of cost for every patient with a low vision, and they can download it. and It's called Seeing AI. And the Microsoft have done such a good job in the sense that uh, this can recognize people around you. It can tell you that this person is there. He's wearing this clothes. He's, he recognizes the emotions of the person that he is happy or he is looking rude or he is looking unhappy or he is annoyed. So it reads the emotions. It tells you the all the information in the sense that barcode reads the barcode. Read the QR code, read the text, read the languages, recognizes the currencies, and uh, everything around you through your through your uh, this uh, program called Seeing AI. So, which is a wonderful uh, device, which is wonderful uh, free of cost device or free of cost application to patients with a low vision aid, and. Uh, most of the patients they don't really know how to or they are not even aware about it so awareness of this is more important to the patient with the low vision than um, and that is what we we really lack then we have google assistant if you want to tell google okay send email to, to this friend and dictate your email the google assistant will send you that and uh, Interesting application of uh, my, uh, the development over Microsoft uh, product Seeing AI is uh, which is called OrCam, OrCam 2. But again, that's something that's a hardware which attaches a kind of small device on the temple of your spectacle and it does each and everything what Seeing AI does. But only advantage is it doesn't require internet. Second advantage is it doesn't need net connectivity, it doesn't need a mobile to attach. You can just feed in the people you want to talk to, you want to recognize, you want to speak to, you want to know what time it is. You don't need to really have a watch, but really show the wrist and AI will understand that you are looking for time. So this kind of intelligence is fed into the OrCam 2, but my thing is that the OrCam 2 is expensive product. That's the only expensive product we have in the low vision, um, um, most of the applications. Otherwise, most of the devices, what I'm, I'm telling you are absolutely, or have very little cost. Then there's one application called Envision. This reads the text and written text, as well as, you know, book, I mean, text from the books in 60 languages. So pay, pay patients from low vision in different, uh, you know, different communities, they can get benefit from an uh, app called Envision by not downloading. Again, it, is, it doesn't involve any cost. For navigation, I will suggest that we have smart case. It was developed by students from IIT. Just vibrates when the ob obstacle is around. That smart cane 
in other countries is uh, enabled with gps is enabled with mobile phones and uh, it tells you there is a program called lookout when the lookout is downloaded it tells you whatever wherever you are around it tells you what surrounding you are in where you are and there are similar applications like uh, there is one paid ad called ira ira is a group of uh, group of people like some elderly populations who is familiar with like some people who are familiar with a particular area they want to help those people with the visually impaired in that particular area so this ira they have a pool of representatives pool of helpers pool of volunteers who can enroll with them and they can whenever a visually impaired patient need any help on navigation on mobility or maybe on a car chair maybe to get a taxi so or to move around so all this ira representatives can help those patients with the low vision and uh, you can attach to them then you have an application called tap tap c which again if you tap your phone just like that it tells you where are where you are which you tells you the location of people around you tells you what the object is in front of you and similar application like there's a in, in it called light detector it tells you whether it is a day or night or whether it is evening or you are moving towards darkness or you are moving towards the light so people with the with visual impairment or with blindness they don't know what the surroundings are so light detector could be of help to know which what time or where what 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 is the uh, brightness around is then one of the interesting application which i will tell you this one uh, is called feel the view like whenever a person is traveling around he is sitting in a car and he wants to know what is happening what to what is the view around the car so you can install your application called feel the view and the person with the low vision can know what is happening around and more. for magnifications we have magnifying glass download it and it becomes your magnifier you don't need to invest your money into those magnifiers and put it into your your schools and you in the patients you know bags and this to magnify object so your magnifying glass app will magnify your glasses magnifying your becomes your handheld magnifier the same thing you have application in this for the big clock which is for time it can magnify your your clock in it and this another one which is called giant giant watch which changes the color of the color of the watch in it by adding the contrast so that you can uh, you can patient with you know having problem with colors by looking at different contrast they can recognize it for mac patient with macular tunnel degeneration these are the two application which is uh, worth looking at what the one is called md md stands for macular degeneration ev reader what it does is this that macular degeneration patient with macular degeneration they have they have when they are given anything to read they have problem in reading because once they magnify it it becomes too it becomes you know too magnified in the sense and they are not able to focus where to read and what to read so this particular application it takes it picks up one line and magnifies only one line at a time so ev reader help patient in the macular degeneration and again there is a app called ev news made by same called md ev news which when you read the news you know there is subtitle in your tv screen which is scrolling at the bottom of this uh, of your television so what md uh, ev news does is that that news which is that the person is speaking about it will be reading that it will be magnifying that news on a tv screen in a very big way so patient with macular degeneration they will find these two application md reader and ev news sometimes you know most of the time press biops they forget their glasses and they don't know what to do I, it happens to me all the time so what helps me is this that an app which is called brighter and bigger if you show if you have, I have to read something i just need to put my phone and i will read that text multiple i mean in a in a bigger font and a bigger font and other I, i don't need to carry my glasses if i, I mean if, if my i lost I forgotten my glasses it can be of help to me then there is one thing what we must, must guide our patient with the low vision is called book share this is an online book share which has almost uh, 850000 books for patient with the low vision which uh, online you know is available for the everywhere for every society so people oh, i mean i'm sure it must be having some subscription which i have not really looked into it and there is one more last one which i'll talk about blind abilities 
which is a blog and podcast which which is specifically for patient with the low vision which tells them what is what is pertinent to patient with the low vision so it gives you the information about the low vision what is happening only the information that should be relevant to patient with the low vision then one more thing the discussion i want to have which i think will be of interest to everyone she once we read about artificial intelligence what we feel is this that the what the rest of the world is worried about in every country is so is something which is uh, is this is going to replace human and all the prediction says yes 40% of the job within 10 years are will be automated so what does it mean that 40% of our jobs are going to be taken away by artificial intelligence whether it is a robo robotics or whether it is artificial uh, artificial intelligence devices could be computer or any 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 device for that matter so who is going to who is most affected and who would be most affected let's know that and which kind of job which will be lost which kind of job which are safe which i think as an optometrist or as a health healthcare provider you should know what will happen what is happening is this who will lose the job understanding artificial, artificial applications you will realize that the job which are manually done number 2 which are repetitive number 3 which are routine number 4 which requires the same kind of uh, understanding are the job which will be missed which will be automated and some of the white collar jobs which i'll tell you people who will lose you know the sub artificial intelligence application we all all noticed but we never realized that this is happened all your atms atm machines what it is it is an artificial intelligence haven't we replaced all those clerks who used to be used to used to stand in line for getting our cash from them where are they they have been replaced already no banks as your cashier they have all have atms that is what is happening that is going to happen for telemarketing for customer service for any job for people who are giving a loan loan in the banks so those are the jobs particularly your uh, in the healthcare if i'll tell you dermatologist cardiologist not cardiologist not to the to great extent but radiologist dermatologist and pathologist are at great the greater risk for of, of automation then people in i care field in i care if we look in more detail i read the list of 780 items the, the prepared by i don't know which comp, which agency prepared it but i saw how which professions are more prone for and when i looked at it in from looking from i care point of view i saw how much chances of optician dispensing opticians to automate and chances that optical shops will not have dispensing opticians in time to come is almost 87% so there is a prediction that within few years dispensing optician will be out of optical shops which i think which is already happening then where it stands optometries optometry have 25% chance that they will be automated 75% are is the hope that you will not be automated and ophthalmologist are at 15% and so ophthalmologist have very very little risk optometrists have slightly higher risk but out of optometrists let me tell you what will be automated out of you your reflection will go totally totally in the hand of computers you have to change your job profile to something which is more creative which is more empathetic which is more strategic which is involves more research which is more uh which is something like a kind of uh, multitasking if you are a person who can do multiple uh, multiple therapies like person who can do sports vision person who can do vision therapy person who can do uh, binocular vision so if you are multitasking within optometry you have safer chances but if you are stick still stuck at the same job of selling optometry so prescribing glasses prescribing glasses will i'll tell you within 2 3 years it will be totally automated you will not be able to in survive in this industry because there are already so many patent which are filed for prescription of glasses 
for uh, automatic uh, booth. There are so many. Essilor have filed a patent in US. There is one patent filed in Israel. And I'm sure there, there's soon once it happens in those countries, it's going to come to India too. So chances that optometrists will do refraction, ophthalmologists will do refraction are very, very remote in future. Then, what is safe? Who is the safest if you look at it? Safest is our nurses, people who take care, caring jobs. If you are looking at elderly, low vision, elderly population, yes, you are the safe. If you Didiatics are safest, psychiatrists are safe, our therapists are safe. So get into in, get involved in therapy, get involved in something more creative, more where you are more emotionally attached to attached to your patients. And uh, do something which is one job which will three jobs which will stay. People's involvement with, with humans. Humanly touch will never come from artificial intelligence. So whether it is HR job, whether it is PR job whether it's an administrative job, whether it's a teaching job, all the faculty of optometry is safe and faculty in ophthalmology is safe in the sense that teaching will never be automated. You may have, we may have library for, library of uh, computers. There are already so many of them. One by IBM Watson, which has 20,000 publications available to medical professionals. And there will be resources for, for them at a particular uh, particular in a particular way, but there will be scope, there will be research and teaching will always be always be growing and will always be always be here. Then one thing I just want to tell you is beyond eye. Two things beyond eye. You know this is something which I told you about the eye care. Now I'll tell you what I can I, artificial intelligence can do through eyes. One is its application of artificial intelligence is happening for, for light detection. You know, previously we used to uh, polygraph test. Now, by looking at the pupil reactions, artificial intelligence is judging what the patient is lying or not the patient, but you know, the person is lying or not. The patients are not uh, saying that the person is lying or the criminal is lying or the person who is asking for a bail is lying or not. So artificial intelligence pupil reaction is judging or coming to taking over the job of polygraph in future. Second application of artificial intelligence, I tell you, beyond eye, is, or it's a very big disability, which any of you, many of you may not know called ALS, and which is called uh, hematopic lateral sclerosis, whereby a patient when diagnosed, he starts losing control on the nerves, control on the muscles, and he doesn't have power in his hands, legs, can't move, can't you know, breathe. And he is basically a vegetable. The only, only organ which is working is the eyes. So scientists were given a challenge that how do you make this person mobile? And Microsoft worked on this. And the device, they use the technology called eye tracking. This is a new technology which is emerging even in a software computing also, whereby Whatever you look at, your computer device, wherever you look at you know, that, your computer screen becomes your mouse and becomes your keyboard. So your, it tracks your eye, your gaze eye tracks, and it can tell, it can, you can use your eyes to write, you can use your eyes to delete, you can, eyes your, you can use your eye gaze to print whatever command your eyes gives at, looking at where you are focusing at. So they used this device and created, you know, they, they, in, you must have seen people on um, certain kind of uh, mo mobile kind of, you know, wheelchairs where, which they move. And how they move is just that they have three controls. One is escalator, other is brake, and third is, I mean, uh, when maneuvering, turning left or right. So wherever the person is moving, he wants to move the cart, he wants to move the wheelchair, he will look at the move which will give a slight speed. If he wants to stop, it will look, he, will, he will look at the brake and the brake will apply. So this is some device which is coming, which is the future for your computing also, which is which is come, I mean, if you look at our newer computers, which are using Microsoft Windows 10, they are using this eye tracking device in your computers too, whereby whatever you look at, that they, instead of verbal speech, instead of you know written speech, your eye command will take over in future. 
One thing more is going to happen in future. You saw I told you about creating a robo, and one robo I want you to understand is a robo which is developed in South uh, by a company from Hong Kong called and the company is called Hanston Robotics, and they developed this robo called Sophia, and she is so beautifully. They, I mean, she is so beautiful and she does so much of a good job that Saudi Arabian government they have given her citizenship. They are so impressed by her, and because she does such a good job for the country, so you can understand. The level of uh, robotics that has developed, they look like humans, their emotions are like human, they talk like human. And one more thing I want to tell you is that there is no one more field I saw in uh, China. It's called medical assistant robo. You know, most of the time, our patients, they spend with the doctor by asking questions. And what they do is this, that this medical robo is given Training to answer question on a particular disease of his of of various you know like if he is trained in ophthalmology diseases and he will guide he will tell the patient that whatever the question you ask he will reply and this robo instead of patient asking the doctor is sent to the robo and the patient will be replied for whatever queries they are so this is something that when they put a human there he did the he could answer only six hundred patients but when they put a robo there. He could answer two thousand patients in a day, so this is something. What I, where the artificial intelligence is? What is the future of artificial intelligence? You know, the future is that I could make my duplicate robot who will look like me, who will behave like me, who could have moment like me. My, who, they will take my smile, they will take my anger, they might take my various emotions, and they can, they can make a robot. Behave like me. The robot can be, you know, programmed to clone my voice. My voice will be exactly. He will be speaking the same tone, same frequency, same, you know, same way I speak. And then what they do? They add chat box to it, whereby when I die, my family can interact with that robot who is looking like me, who has intelligence like me, and who is behaving like me, and who is talking like. Me. So this is something which you, which can. You can give your will to your children, and your your robo after your death can read out your will or read out whatever you want to say, and it can remain where you are not there. So this AI is something very fascinating, very interesting, and two or three more. One application which I want to tell you is this is something called artificial intelligence for charity. And this is a good one in the sense that why I want to mention is this initiative is taken by Johnson Johnson, and whereby you can donate your photo every day. I don't know whether they work in India, but they work in US. Or I have not I have not really applied it, but I have read it because I was going through a lot of it in during the last few days. So it is called donate a photo whereby you send your picture one picture one day, and Johnson Johnson will donate one dollar for a particular charity. And that picture not necessarily should be yours, but anything you like around. So it, I'm sure you can just note this app called Donate a Photo and start sending your and start helping a charity. And one more is keep yourself fit. There's an application called Charity Mile. If you walk one mile, or if you cycle one mile, or if you do any exercise outdoor one mile, your charity, this charity, you will be. Contributing to a charity, whereby your application, your mobile will track you how much did you my how much did you walk, how much did you exercise, and per hour your contribution will go to a charity. So charity mile and download a photo. Just note it down, and I'm sure that you can contribute to a charity without doing much for a cause. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm sure you will have a lot of questions, or you may not have a question because you must be tired. And so am I. Thank you. I think it is um, the mind is full of questions, but yes, we've extended our time far beyond, and uh, we would love to come back and we'd like to play this again and again. And there's a suggestion, of course, Oli. If there's any question, we'll bring it up. But it's wiser now to bring in clippings of your lecture, more focused, and then deliberating on. Um, one by one topic so once this goes out as a as a complete comprehensive session 
I suggest that uh, there could be questions or we could pick up one by one and then have clippings promoted out because I know it's been too much of um, um, things. The, the message, of course, goes in. It's like an ocean and we have to dip in it now. And we have to bring out all these things and pearls that you have given us. But there's this understanding and moving towards it as we want to make a practical part of it, we'll have to bring in small, small sections. There could be a handout book, like your telehealth book, which you should think about bringing it forward so that whatever you've gone through and your knowledge, which has been immense, can be brought in black and white. So, so um, Oli, if there are any questions, we can. However, we would like this to be our base session and we would like that this can go on and on with discussions beyond compare and as people can be initiated into it smaller sessions. Right. So I, many had been we extended. There could have been some people leaving. There were a lot many. So we have yeah. to attract the audience again into it. So what we can do is segment these videos in a small, small module and then post it uh, and then get the questions answered uh, more detailed because I think there are many people to attend other sessions or some other thing. So you can uh, discuss probably a little later half. Good. Right. Okay. Yeah, so uh, ma'am, if, if you can conclude the session and then I will be doing the rest work of splitting into different segment and sharing it all. Yeah, so I think the word conclusion is uh, not the right word. It's actually the beginning today. It's a beginning where we have had so much to see. And I was like, really, do we really need to invest in a lensometer? Do I really need to invest in something? I think the clinics need to invest and an optometrist needs to invest in apps now. It's if I'm thinking about expensive things and bringing it into the curriculum, the modules. I mean, your lecture itself means a lot for my students and the next generation will pick up more than what we can do when they're smarter enough to handle these smart gadgets. So it's bringing, integrating it into our education system, learning more about it, experimenting with it, matching and validating that these apps are as good as our tools. And of course, there's a lot more saving in it. There's saving in time and there is saving in work, detection, screening, and optometry, of course, prevention of blindness. The kind of old, processes that we had gone through going deep into the outreach screening you cannot be doing glaucoma screening if you want to do an outreach camp and then cataract you have a 300 patient opd coming up in a camp screening and it's impossible um, even if the team's number of people that you engage take them across still you cannot deliver this imagine an app doing the screening and detecting cataract as you have said and detecting amblyopia, how much easier the prevention of blindness model could be. So not only in a commercial aspect, but I see all this is going to be a, a, a big advantage in prevention of blindness. So as you had rightly said, optometrists are needed to are the ones who will take forward these technologies because ophthalmology has its handful, in fact, Ophthalmology will get back these patients when we suspect and send them across. So, so there is so much food for thought that you have given in today. It was so interesting that each word was like, let's make, put it back into my mind. But we will have to rewind so many things that you have been telling us, bring it forward. And as, as it is suggested that if we really want to make an impact about this beautiful session that you have conducted, let us bring back small, small clippings. Let's integrate, let's have a handbook. Let's have information coming back again and again. And I'm sure the future is here. So thank you so much. We um, always have been learning from you and you bringing in the, the latest information, integrating multidisciplinary. And, um, and I think it's not the conclusion, it is 
the beginning. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ali. In fact, he's the host, and I'm the co-host. Without him, we can never manage things. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. Thank you.